you, Pastor Topaz, for such a kind introduction. If you all have not been a part of that conversation, racism in the church that our young adult sponsors, make sure you get on that link and make sure you check that out. Well worth the time. Let's pray and jump into the word this morning. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray for preaching power. We pray for a fresh anointing. Our country is in turmoil right now, God. Our cities are in turmoil. Our states are in turmoil. So as I go to the word, God, I'm praying that as I speak to the church specifically today, that people within your kingdom will hear what's being said and apply the truth to their lives so we can become united and be the people that you would have us to be. So God, prepare my hearts. Let me speak with clarity. I empty myself up so that you can get the glory. It is in your name we pray and thank you. Amen and amen. Jump with me to John. I want to read this text first. John chapter 4. I'm going to read verses 1 through 10. A very, very familiar passage of scripture that you're all familiar with. I'm not going to deal with the entire passage, just the first 10 verses that I want to share with you uh, today as we look at the text. This is the woman at Samaria that Jesus met at the well. But I want to take an interesting perspective at it, at it that the Lord dropped in my spirit. I want us to focus on this subject. A biblical response to racism, and listen where I'm going to say this, in the church. Let me read. Now verse 1 says in John chapter 4, Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar near the field that Jacob had given to his son Jacob, uh, Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, weary as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well, and it was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Uh, Jesus said to her, give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? And it says here, parenthetically, in my translation, for Jews have no dealing with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Now, just by way of a brief introduction, if you were to reflect in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, you would find there that when God created humans... He created us all after his image and after his likeness. This means that we are all image bearers. We all carry the image of God within us. In relates or regards to our interpersonal relationship, that means there is capacity within each of us to love each other the way God loves us. Why? Because God is love. In Matthew 23, 22 and 37, we, we are taught what the greatest commandment is. And here what it is, here's what it is, that we should love God, first of all, and second, we should love our neighbors as ourselves. Now, the challenge as I see it is not so much with the first part of the commandment. The challenge really is with the second part. Yes, we love God with all our heart, but the second part that says love your neighbor as yourself, that presents a challenge for most of us. What I've learned about this very command is that loving my neighbor is very, very easy as long as my neighbor looks like me. Loving my neighbor is very easy as long as my neighbor dresses the same as me, okay? Loving my neighbor is very easy as long as my neighbor lives in the same community that I live in. Loving them, it's very easy if we have the same denominational affiliation. Let me even go here. Loving my neighbor is easy if we have the same skin tone. What makes it difficult is when my neighbor looks different from me, when they live in a different neighborhood, when they're different ethnically, when they're different culturally, when they're different socially, when we have different religious affiliation, 
that be part of the command to love your neighbor as you love yourself becomes very, very difficult. Well, let me, let me clean that up a little bit. It is not that we don't love our neighbor. Let me say it like, right, right? As we love ourselves, the issue becomes putting the love into action by demonstrating that love. What, what that means when I, I, in other words, to be as simple as to say hello to my neighbor, to say uh, um, good morning to the person that's living next to me across the street. Putting my love in action makes the second part of that commandment very difficult because then it means that I am now challenged, I'm now called to have an interaction with you and that makes this very difficult and very challenging. According to Matthew 6 and 10, um, the goal of us as image bearers, uh, those of us that know the Lord, let me clean that up, those of us that have accepted Christ in our lives as personal Lord and Savior, is heaven and earth. And a lot of us are saying, well, let us wait until we get to heaven for things to be fixed. Let us wait until we get to heaven for it to get right. But I want to challenge you. I think the, the issue that Matthew is saying in Matthew 6 and 10 is that your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We should be practicing now here on earth and don't wait until we get to heaven to get it right. Lord, have mercy. So the text that we are confronted with today it presents us with a great illustration of two people groups that existed next to each other, yet they were apart from each other. And what's striking that we're going to look at in the text is how Jesus responded to these two people groups. And what it does is it gives us now a biblical precedent such that the church today can really develop a biblical response to racism that exists within the very church of God. And when I'm saying church, I'm not talking about one local entity. I'm talking about church big C, the church of God. Now, the passage we are confronted with today, Jesus, it follows the encounter of Jesus and Nicodemus, where, where God, where he was saying to Nicodemus that God so loved the world, right? That he loves all image bearers, that he sent his son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That, that's that passage in John chapter three. But subsequent to Jesus' encounter with Nicodemus, his disciples were baptizing along the countryside of Judea, right? And as Jesus' ministry was expanding and growing, word got out that he was having great ministry impact. And, and, and as he was having this great impact, the Pharisees grew concerned. They grew troubled that Jesus' church might be outpacing them. Boy, doesn't that sound like some of us today, right? And this, of course, now what it did, because Jesus didn't come to build a, 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 some local denomination, he decided to relocate and leave that mission field and move on to the region of Galilee. Now, this is where the text gets exciting. So let's, let's take a moment to walk through this text a little at a time. So look with me at verse 1 through 6. Let me read again. Now, when, the, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, lock into this, he left Judea and departed for Galilee. Look at verse 4. And he had to pass through Samaria. Now he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, named the field, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. It says Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. And my Bible says it was about the sixth hour. Now, now I want you to see the setup so we can get to the depth of what we're going to be talking about today. Verse 4 said, he had to go through Samaria. What is so striking? I mean, that verse says in verses between 1 and 6, he had to go through Samaria. What was so striking about the passage through Samaria? Here's what you need to know, right? Historically, in the New Testament, Samaria was a region in the middle of Palestine with Judea to the south and Galilee up to the north. Now, the people were racially mixed. It was a mixture of Jewish people and Gentile people whose ancestry goes way back and they're 
intermingled and they formed this race of people called the Samaritan. What's striking about the Jews and the Samaritan is that they claimed the same God, Jehovah Yahweh, Yahweh Elohim. They claimed the same God, but the Samaritan worshiped on Mount Gerizim and, 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 and they had this crazy rivalry. It was a bitter rivalry going on for centuries and for years and for a long time between the Jews and the Samaritan, which normally ended up in some crazy political hostility. I think I'm saying something familiar today. Now, here's what the text says. He had to go through Samaria. Now, now here's what you need to know about this. Historically and culturally, Samaria then was the shortest route to Galilee. But because the Jews disliked the Samaritans, here's what they would do on that journey for to, 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 to Galilee. They would cross the Jordan on the east. They would take the long route, walk all along that coast of the eastern coast of the Jordan, take that long route just to avoid the Samaritans because I'm going to say this over and over again, the Jews had no dealings with the Samaritan. They would take that long route just to get all the way to Galilee, extending the length of time that it took to take that journey. Now, now here's what Jesus did. As opposed to taking that long route that the Jews has been taking for centuries and for a long time, he decided that, you know what? Time out for this. Let me just say that there's time for a biblical response to racism amongst these image bearers that I've created. So what does he do? He decides to take the short route. And I love the way John says this in the text. I must go through. He had need to go through Samaria. Samaria. Now, now I find that I find that very, very interesting because it's very similar to the hatred between two people groups or people groups that exist in our country today. This is no different than the racism that we see today that resulted in the civil rights movement back in the 50s and the 60s. So here's what was happening between the Jews and the Samaritans, right? The Jews hated the Samaritans. They thought that the Samaritans were not image bearers. They thought that Samaritans were not considered human. They thought that the Samaritans were not people. They devalued them and they thought that they were less than. If you go back to the civil rights, you will see some of the laws that the the Jews had with the Samaritans. Don't go in the restroom where Samaritans went. So they probably had signs that says Jews only. Don't drink from the water fountains that Samaritans have drunk from. So they probably had signs over the water fountains that says Jews only. Don't ride in the same seats in the bus. Oh Lord, I know you're hearing me this morning that the Samaritans have ridden in. So they probably had signs that says sit in the front and Samaritans go to back to the back. No different than what we saw during the civil rights rights movement and no different than some of the things that still happening in our country today. And let me go here. It's no different than some of the things that's happening amongst the very people of God. Though we may not overtly have signs, we're saying it. We're doing it. Our behaviors are showing it. And, and I want to be clear today, I am not trying to solve the problem of racism in the world this morning. I am trying to get the people of God to come together and put an end to the foolishness so we can love God and love people the way God wants us to love people. No different. And we see that going on. And here's what Jesus said. I must go through Samaria. Here's my challenge today with this word. I want you to hear me. I am hoping that by the end of the message, the people of God will stop crossing the Jordan to the east and taking the long scenic route to Gal Galilee, and we will start making the statement together. We've got to go through Samaria. We've got to break this stuff. We've got to put an end to the racism that exists within the church. We've got to put an end to the divides that exists within the very house of God and bring the people of God together. So it was a divine mandate from God that Jesus had to go through Samaria. I'm hoping you hear me say today, it is a divine mandate from God that there's a time where the people of God must make the same statement. We've got to go through Samaria. So the story gets interesting now. Jesus, Jesus makes it 
to Samaria, then he makes it to this whale. I'm going to read this in a little while. Lord, this is getting exciting to me. And, and this is the setup, right? I want you, I'm, I'm going to role play this because I want you to see. So lest we miss what's really happening in the passage, like the Jews of Jesus' day, there was this different route. But, 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 but here's what we do. We take different routes home, right? This is no different. Where they took the scenic route, we know we live next to a person as opposed to taking the direct route. We don't like them, so we go around. We know we sit next to James in the church, but because we don't like him, here's what we do. We take the scenic route. We know we don't like Sally in the office, so as opposed to getting there, here's what we do. We take the scenic route. In this instance, Jesus says, I've got to get there. So I want y'all to see this. Let me, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me let you see what this looks like, right? So Jesus says, I've got to go through Samaria. So he, he picks himself and he takes the journey, right? And he makes it all the way to Samaria. And then here's what he does. He takes his seat by the well. And as he's sitting there by the well, he is waiting for someone to come, right? He is waiting because God had sent him there. God has positioned him there. It was time for this thing to be breaking. So notice, notice verse 7. Look at what it says in verse 7. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. And Jesus said to her, give me a drink. And verse 8 says, look at this, look at the setup. His disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Look at verse 8. And the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samarita, Samaria? And I love the author's comment, for Jews had no dealings with Samaria, Samaritans. And I'm going to hit verse 10 in a little while. You got to see this, okay? So Jesus is sitting there. This woman comes to the well. And you know how women have peripheral vision behind their head. They can see a brother looking at them, but they don't have to look at him, right? They just look, but they know he's looking. So she knows Jesus is looking. She knows that Jesus is sitting there. It's not like she missed him. But hear me say this. She had absolutely no intention whatsoever to say a single word to Jesus. So Jesus is just sitting here watching this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm going to see what's happened. And the woman comes, and she draws her water and she's talk, turning around to leave. But notice this. Jesus now, because it was divine intention in him being there, he initiates the conversation. Hey, lady, can I have a drink? That rocked her world. And that changed everything as it relates to this woman's situation. And I want us to walk through this. I want us to talk through this because this is the beginning of what I want to share with you because I want you to see what's really happening here. So, so here, here's what you need to know about this thing, even historically and culturally, okay? Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. There were laws that were written that says that if a Samaritan touch a vessel, the vessel becomes unclean. There were laws written. Doesn't this sound familiar, right? There were systems put in place to prevent the interaction of Jews and Gentiles, of Jews and Samaritans. Ah, ah, Lord, I hope you're seeing the similarities to what we're dealing with. And here's the other part. Rabbis did not speak to women. And if a, a rabbi spoke to a woman at a well, there were laws that spoke to the fact that flirtation might be going on and things might be happening. So everything was written around it to prevent the interaction of these two people group. And the systems were developed that one group would, would have an unfair advantage while the other group would be kept down. Lord Jesus, I hope you're seeing the similarities that exist today. So this Samaritan woman, she was well aware of the ethnic gulf that separated Jews and Samaritans, right? She expressed a puzzlement. She was puzzled at the fact that Jesus, a Jew, would ask her, a Samaritan, for a drink. Here's what I said the text says. Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. So Jews generally avoid it. And she was shocked that this Jew did not avoid her, right? Listen to this. Some Jews were willing to eat with Samaritans, but many were not willing to go own the ritual defilement. So they would do this in secret, but in public they would never own up to the fact that they hung out with the Samaritan. Why? Because it would ritually or ceremonially defile them. 
There were laws written about that. Apart from the, epi- the ethnic sensibilities, men and women would not have theological conversations. There was a divide that that would not happen. Samaritan and Jews, listen to this, they worshiped the same God. And both used the same law. But they despised each other's places of worship and they remained hostile toward each other for centuries. Before I even move into the text, let me say this to you. Whether you want to agree with me or not, the same thing is happening within the church of God amongst the very people of God. And if the church is going to have a biblical response to racism in the world, the church needs to have a biblical response, first of all, to racism in the church. How do we engage each other? How do we address each other? How do we interact with each other? So when we go in the world, we present a united front. So based on this woman's encounter, here's the switch I want to go here. Based on how she interacted with Jesus, hear hear me say this. This woman racially profiled Jesus and concluded that problems existed between them. Listen to her issues. Listen to what she says. Listen to this. We are ethnically different and we should not be addressing each other. Listen to the ethnic difference. I'm a Samaritan. You are a Jew. There is ethnic difference between us, and the law says, and the culture says, and culture dictates we should not be interacting. She racially profiled him ethnically. Look at the second thing. Culturally, she profiled him, right? We cannot share the same vessel because you consider my water pot unclean. She profiled him. Oh my gosh, I hope you see what I'm saying, right? And the culture dictates that because you see me as unclean, and because you see me as a person that's not really bearing the image of God, our cultural differences say we should not interact with each other. Listen to the third thing. She profiled him socially. Lock into this. She says, you are a rabbi. I am a female. There is a social gap between us. We should not be speaking to each other. And I love the last one because this is where the church come in, right? She profiled him spiritually or as it relates to his place of worship. You, we worship at Mount Gerizim. You worship in Jerusalem. Let me help y'all with that one today because y'all might miss this. Hey, here's what the black church says. We have gospel music. We have organs. We have keyboards. We have drums. We shout to the rhythm of the beat. We have Church, you people worship with the guitar. You don't have an organ. You don't have the drum. You sing boring songs. We sing songs with rhythm. And we profile each other based on this spiritual or religious or worship differences. And it's time to put an end to it. This woman was racially profiling Jesus. And I want you to hear me say, in the church of God, We racially profile each other just as well. And there comes a point in time where we need to put an end to it, okay? We must put an end to the division of of the ethnical issues, of of the cultural issues, of, of the social issues, of the worship wars that we have within the very church of God. I can't come to your church because I'm white. And we see in the church of God, whites can't follow black leadership. And blacks are saying, I can't go to your church because you're white. Your music doesn't fit me and we've created this gulf and this chasm so we see all this racism in the world and here's what the black church is saying where is the white church and here's what the white church saying it's your war it's your fight and they want to get involved but because we don't deal with each other we can't solve the problem and there comes an end where we must understand what a biblical response to the issue of racism is in the church of God I want to talk about a brief solution. I want to talk about, and my solution is not comprehensive, but it's just some challenges I want to present to those of us who name the name of God. I want you to see how Jesus responded. I want you to see how Jesus answered this woman. I want you to see what Jesus said to her. And if as people of God, 
we can have that within us, I'm telling you, we can have a proper biblical response to the issue of racism within the church. Because here's what happens. When we encounter racist issues, as opposed to us responding biblically, we respond through the flesh. And when the flesh rises, people get hurt, feelings get hurt. We go and we protest and we start tearing buildings down. We start doing things we ought not be doing, but we name the name of God. We ought to be the people of God and we ought to respond biblically to each other such that the church can be advanced and we can get to where we need to go. So here's what I'm saying. Our response ought to be filtered and addressed through the finished work of Jesus on Calvary, right? If, if, if this were me and this were you addressing this issue, we would do it completely differently. But I want you to see what Jesus says. And I think this one verse, I'm going to share three things from this one verse. And I'm going to be brief on this because we can elaborate this longer. This one verse captures everything Jesus said to this woman. Notice what he said to her in verse 10. And I'm going to share my three points with you. Notice what Jesus said. Jesus answered her, lady, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. This is so paramount. Um, um, the, reason, the reason I want you to see, notice the text. Notice what he says. If you knew the gift of God. Lady, if you knew the gift of God. Lady, if you knew the gift of God. So here's the first thing. Here's the very first thing I want to share with you, right? A biblical response to racism in the church begins with a relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm going to say it again. A biblical response to the issue of racism in the church begins with a relationship with Jesus Christ. Lock into this. The reason the lady came to the well and took her water and was going to leave without initiating that conversation with Jesus, I'm going to say this, is because she did not know the gift of God. Jesus is clear, right? So, so here it is. Well, once we have accepted Christ in our life as Lord and Savior, it makes a whole big difference in our lives. And I'm saying this to believers in Christ because if we name the name of God, there is no reason for us to keep ignoring each other. And Jesus himself said to her, the reason you're ignoring me, if God were in you, you would have recognized who I was. So it begins with a personal relationship with God. Now hear me, I am not downplaying the hurts and the damage that was caused historically in this country by slavery. slavery. Please hear me say that. I am not downplaying the need for us to speak up on issues of social injustice. We need to do that. But within the church, if we know who God is, we cannot continue to ignore each other. And I want to drive that point home because I'm going to be bold enough to say this. If we keep ignoring each other, my conclusion is going to be we say we know God, but we really don't know who God is. And it begins with a relationship with God. If you have and if I have a proper relationship with God, that's the beginning point of addressing. We can have that conversation. We can sit at the table of brotherhood. This was the beauty of what our young adults did several Fridays ago. We had church leaders. We had theologians. We had um, community leaders on that call having a conversation. Why? Because they all had a relationship with God. So church people, if we have a relationship with God, we should not be carrying this racism and hatred and animosity within us. We must deal with it. So number one, it begins with a relationship with God. And if that relationship is there, we can begin to have the dialogue. Look at the second thing. Look at the second thing. I just want to share three things. Look at the second thing, right? A biblical response to racism in the church requires, this is important, I love this point, a thorough understanding of who Jesus is. Let me read, let me read, let me read, right? Look at, look at verse 10, look at verse 10. If you knew the gift of God, and I like this, and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you. Oh my goodness, let me read that one more time. Let me read that one more time. He says, if you knew the gift of God, and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, 
you would have asked him and he would have done what? He would have given you. This is critical. And I want to take my time on this because I don't want to be before you long. Here's the deal. Lady, if you have accepted Christ, church, if you've accepted Christ, people out there in a virtual world, if you have accepted Christ, let me flesh this out. My understanding of the theology of the doctrine of the Trinity says one God eternally exists in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Now here's the importance of this doctrine. One God in three persons. Here's how that fleshes it out. Every believer under the sound of my voice, within you, you possess the spirit of Christ. And I wish I had time to go through what it says in Galatians 1 and 24 through 27, right? But the bottom line of that scripture is that inside of me dwells the very presence of God himself. This is the beauty of me being an image bearer, and this is the beauty of you being an image bearer. Inside of you dwells the presence of God himself. So here's the importance of a thorough and a proper understanding of who Jesus is. So here's that means. When I look at you, I I shouldn't see you. I should see the God in you. I wish I had somebody in here. That's if the Holy Spirit dwells in you. When I look at you, I shouldn't see you. I should see the God that dwells within you. But here's what we do. Because of all this racism and hatred and, and, and all this cultural divide and ethnic divide and social divide and, and religious or worship divide, when I look at you, I can't get past who you are. I stop on the outside and I can't get to the God in you and it prevents me from seeing who you are. Are. When you look at me, you should not see the black skin. You should see the God on the inside. When I look at you, I shouldn't see the white skin. I should see the God on the inside. When I look at you, I shouldn't see the brown skin. I should see the God on the inside. And if, if I'm connected to God, if I have a relationship, my goal is to see past the external and see the value on the inside. And if I see the value on the inside... There is no way on God's earth I can leave you at that well without offering you a drink. Very, very important that you not miss this. Secondly, it requires a thorough understanding of who Jesus is. Because if I know who Jesus is and you name the name of God, my press is to see the God in you. Not to associate you with the historical damage, but see you as an image bearer, a person who wants to make a difference. A person who say, I must needs go through Samaria to bridge the divide. We see each other through the eyes of Christ. Why? Because the spirit of God dwells within us. Here is how we handle racism in the church. Start seeing Jesus on the inside and stop seeing Felix on the outside. When I see you, I need to start seeing Jesus on the inside and stop seeing what I see on the outside. Here's what happens. When I see you on the outside, it takes my mind back to 400 years of slavery. When I see you on the outside, it takes my mind back to the hurt that you caused me. It takes my mind back to the injustice that was done. It takes my mind back to all those places. And here's what happens. We transfer it into the church of God and the people of God in the church of God can't seem to get along. We've got to stop this. Here's my third and final thing. A biblical response to racism in the church requires that we continually walk in the spirit. And my goodness, I don't really have time to flesh this out. But here's what Jesus said to her, right? If you knew the gift of God and who it was that was asking you uh, for drink, it says you would have given him, you would have asked him and he would have given you. And I love this last phrase, living water, living water. I wish you'd say it with me, living water, living water. I don't have time to go into all the significance of living water. But let me just say this. When you do your research and you do your work in the Bible, you'll find that sometimes or more times than often that phrase living water equals to the spirit of God. So here's what he said. You would have asked me, and, and here's what a living water speaks to. It's not talking about a stagnant well that's not flowing. It's talking about water that's constantly being replenished and refreshed and poured over, over, and over, and over again. So here's what the spirit does. 
you would have been walking in the spirit. Here's what walking in the spirit does. Galatians says it this way. Walk in the spirit so I will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. So here's what that means. God, I'm about to encounter my brown brother. Let me see God in him. God, I'm about to encounter my white sister. Lord, let me see God in her. I'm about to encounter my black brother. Let me see God in them. And if we can walk in the spirit and kill the flesh, we crucify the flesh daily we will be amazed that we can have a proper biblical response to the issues of racism in the church. Let me end here. Maybe you don't know who the Samaritans are in your life. It could be that person that's ethnically, culturally, socially, or religious with a different religious preference that works next to you. It could be that person that lives next door to you that you haven't spoken to. It could be that police officer that lives in your neighborhood that you don't like, but he names the name of God. It could be anybody that's different from you. And God is saying, time to stop walking around and start walking through. Go to people and give them that smile like the song says. Go to people and show the love of God. So here's my challenge today. I so appreciate that song that the worship team just sang. Don't just stop with a smile, even though it's necessary. Extend a smile to a conversation. Go through Samaria this week and meet you a Samaritan. And don't wait for them to initiate. You begin the conversation. Give me a drink. And look at the unity we can bring to the house of God, in the very place of God, and notice the impact we can have on the world. I'm going to say it again. A biblical response, number one, to the issue of racism in the church, it begins with a relationship with Jesus Christ. Very, very important. Secondly, a biblical response to racism in the church, it requires a thorough understanding of who Jesus is. And thirdly, a biblical response to racism in the church requires that we continually walk in the spirit. I want to pray this morning and I want to pray for the church. I'm not worried about the world. Because if the church get it together, the world will be together. We've got to come together. We need to hold hand in hand in the house of God and go into the world and say, for God we live and for God we die. We stand. If one is hurting, the other hurt. If a black life is hurting, that means white lives come together and fight for that black life. If a white life is hurting, black lives come together and fight for that white life. If a brown life is working, hurting, black and white lives come together and fight for that brown lives. Why? Because we are image bearers. We all bear the image of God. But we've got to come together and put an end to the divides that exist within the church of God. Let me pray with you this morning. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I thank you for you. If there's one, God, under the sound of my voice, God, that heard this word and they want to say, Lord, I repent of my profiling people within the church, of my racial profiles, God, 1 John 1 and 9 says, if we confess, you're faithful and just to forgive and if there's one that's saying, God, it begins with a relationship and I've been wrestling, but I don't know you like that, Lord, I pray that they invite you into their hearts and come and know you as personal Lord and Savior. Forgive us, God. First Chronicles still says, if my people, you're speaking to the church, you're not talking to the world, who are called by my name shall humble themselves and come together. We've got to stop the long routes and go directly through Samaria. Knit our hearts Bring us back together, Lord, so we can love each other the way you love us. In your name we pray and thank you. Amen and amen. Wow, what a powerful message. This woman, this Samaritan woman, dealing with the issue of Samaritans and Jews. How she profiled Jesus and how that almost put her in a predicament to miss everything that she received. Yes, to miss out on her blessing. Almost. And, and so, you know, one thing that I would, that comes to mind for me in this situation was, you know, what is underneath the profiling, mm -hmm. right? So what are the actual structures in place or the culture in place that gave her these assumptions to work with in the first place? And I think for me, that's where we as church members, as a church body need to look at, um, right? And seeing how do we actually question those assumptions and where those assumptions come from, especially when they um, can, can produce inequitable outcomes, they can produce disproportionate rates 
right? COVID-19, <laughs> a perfect example, right? Um, of who's been impacted at a disproportionate rate right. with uh, death, different death rates. And so I think that we have to look underneath right, those, those structures um, that give us those assumptions to work with. Um, and really, I would say replace that, those underbodies of prejudice and racism um, with love, right? Um, to be able to tap into what Jesus gave us, right? His greatest sacrifice um, and doing that in love. Amen. Take out those undercurrents and replace them with love. So we are transitioning now to our offering and you have many ways to give. One of them is to text give RCF to 73256 and the amount that you are going to be giving. You can give through our website at www.rcfministries.org. You can give by clicking the give button. That's the simple way or mail your gift to 15 640 East 6th Avenue, Aurora, Colorado, 80011, or you can always drop it off. We are here to receive that offering. So thank you for joining us today. We look forward to fellowshipping with you again on Wednesday. But if you would like to see this message again, we'll be back at 5 p.m. Our Sunday services are live every week, 7 p.m. on Wednesdays, 9 and 11 on Sundays. Have a wonderful, God-blessed week.